Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining us on the program. I'm Amarachi Ubani in Lagos. Let's begin with the developments in the Russian invasion. A Russian lawmaker taking part in peace talks with Kyiv wants Russia to consider the death penalty for the Ukrainian soldiers being evacuated from the Azovstal steel plant. He referred to the soldiers as nationalist fighters. In a debate in the state Duma, the lower house of Russia's parliament, after the defendants, uh, defenders of Ukraine's Azovstal steelworks surrendered, Lawmaker Leonid Slutsky said although Russia has a moratorium on the death penalty, it should think carefully about capital punishments from the Azov, for the Azov fighters. In his words, they do not deserve to live after the monstrous crimes against humanity that they have committed and that are committed continuously against our prisoners. Lawmakers at the State Duma were discussing the possibility of a ban on the exchange of fighters from the Azov regiment. Uh, four Russian servicemen initially proposed by Deputy Anatoly Vesemann, uh, according to a telegram. Uh, one Russian media agency quoted the speaker as saying Nazi criminals should not be exchanged. Here's more in this report. Ukrainian's military ceded control of the strategic port city of Mariupol to Russia on Tuesday, announcing it was working to evacuate all remaining troops from their last stronghold in the Azovstal steel plant. Ukraine's President Vladimir Zelensky stressed the importance of saving lives in his nightly address. As regards the situation in Mariupol, thanks to the actions of the Ukrainian military, armed forces of Ukraine, intelligence negotiating group, the international community of the Red Cross and the United Nations, we hope that we will be able to save the lives of our guys. There are severely wounded ones among them. They are given care. I want to stress out, Ukraine needs Ukrainian heroes alive. According to reports, five buses were seen carrying troops from Azovstal arriving in Novozovsk late Monday. Some of the evacuated troops were wounded and carried out of the buses on stretchers. Some 600 troops were believed to have been inside the steel plant. Russian state-run media outlets also posted footage of what they say were injured Ukrainian soldiers being evacuated from Azovstal. They are expected to be exchanged for Russian prisoners of war. Meanwhile, over Sweden and Finland's NATO bids, President Vladimir Putin appeared to climb down from Russia's objections to both countries joining NATO, saying the countries poses no direct threat to them. However, the expansion of military infrastructure into his territory would certainly provoke the response. Well, Mr. Prime Minister, welcome. It's great to have you here. U.S. President Joe Biden met with the Greek Prime Minister Kyriakos Mitsotakis in the Oval Office in Washington, D.C., saying they would discuss their ongoing support for Ukraine and trade partnerships. Mr. Takis described the U.S.-Greek relationship at an all-time high and that the two countries were facing united the challenge of Russia's invasion into Ukraine. Sadly, Russia's brutal attack on Ukraine uh, is also about threat to democracy from autocrats and want to bear down on rules-tested orders and rule-based orders. I want to thank you, Mr. Prime Minister, uh, for Greek's moral leadership here. It's not easy, I know, but thank you. And we have much to discuss today, our ongoing support for Ukraine, our deepening defense and uh, trade partnerships, energy security, climate change, and so much more. Uh, two countries have always been on the right side of history. We fought in wars together. Uh, and, of course, we are now facing united uh, the challenge of Russia's uh, uh, invasion uh, into, into Ukraine. Uh, at the same time, uh, this visit is an opportunity to um, reassess the status of our relationship. Last week, Greece's parliament approved the renewal and amendment of a defense cooperation agreement with the United States. First signed in 1990, it allows U.S. forces to train and operate in Greek territory. The latest amendment, agreed in 2021, extends the cooperation by allowing the presence of U.S. forces in four more military areas. 
Amidst attack has stirred parliaments, the agreement shields the country against security threats, and that agreement grows in importance against the backdrop of the war in Europe. In the meantime, Finnish President Sauli Ninnis has begun a two-day visit to Sweden. He met with King Carl Gustaf. Both men travelled to the royal palace in a horse-drawn carriage. They both said the visit would focus on Finland and Sweden's decision to join NATO. After the meeting at the palace, the minister is scheduled to address the Swedish parliament and then meet a Swedish Prime Minister, Magdalena Andersson. The decisions by Finland and Sweden to apply to NATO set the two countries on a path towards find or ending policies of military non-alignment that have defined their defence strategies since the start of the Cold War. But the ascension process hit a snag when NATO member Turkey's president said he would not approve either bid. The viewers, Anna Chernikova is in Kyiv. Anna, great to see you. We're trying to understand, you know, what happened at the Azostol still plant today. Did the soldiers surrender and then on what conditions? Uh, hi. Well, um, it doesn't, um, well, I mean, it doesn't really uh, announce or seem a surrender. What we know is that uh, it was an agreement, uh, an agreement for evacuation, uh, which uh, was in work for the past couple of weeks, as what we know from the Ukrainian officials. Uh, what we also know that as what President Zelensky confirmed in his uh, late evening speech that uh, this evacuation was uh, provi was or organized and realized by the Ukrainian army, Ukrainian intelligence, uh, as well as international partners, um, uh, International Red Cross Organization and uh, the representatives of the UN. Uh, so um, this more looks like an evacuation uh, in order to exchange afterwards, exchange soldiers. Uh, so, and this is exactly uh, what is the plan uh, according to Ukrainian officials. So, for the moment, we know that 53 heavy injured uh, soldiers were evacuated from Rostov, uh, in addition, 211 soldiers uh, were also evacuated. So all these people are waiting for uh, to be exchanged uh, to um, to Russian soldiers. Um, you know, uh, it's really very um, delicate situation, as uh, what also President Zelensky mentioned. Um, how it looks and what we can definitely say that it was a certain agreement done. So uh, otherwise it would never be possible. Yeah, um, quite a confusing situation there. But the soldiers uh, which are being evacuated from Azovstal are being moved to Russian-held territories. And what in the parliament is discussing what could happen to them. And one of them is even calling for the death penalty. What really is the fate of these soldiers? Um, so this is true. Uh, for the moment, Ukrainian soldiers are uh, evacuated to the Russian-controlled territory in Donetsk region. Um, what we've heard from the representatives of the Russian um, parliament, uh, what they propose to, to vote, as, as, if I remember correctly, tomorrow, um, well, it looks a little bit, you know, different from the agreement that was announced by the Ukrainian side, uh, definitely. What we know from Ukraine, from the Ukrainian official, from the Deputy uh, Minister of Defense of Ukraine, that uh, she, Anna Mahler, she confirmed that negotiations are very difficult, but they are still ongoing. And uh, she said that um, the uh, the you know, what basically Russian Parliament um, was saying today. Uh, she thinks and she presented it more as um, uh, as a certain internal uh, po politic communication for Russian uh, society uh, and Russian politic um, politic organizations. Uh, she says that negotiations still going and negotiations are as follows that all Ukrainian soldiers would be exchanged. Of course, here in Ukraine, uh, there are different emotions on that. Um, everyone understands that probably it was very difficult to reach at least any agreement. And everyone understands that the most important is to save life of, of Ukrainian soldiers. But again, 
uh, there is no within the society uh, there is definitely no hundred uh, percent uh, you know uh, belief that all the agreements would be uh, fulfilled because this, this agreements with Russia. So this is how society is reacting to that. Uh, well, uh, I really hope that uh, that negotiations would go on and that this uh, uh, this announcement by Russian government in, t- in terms of Azov Battalion uh, would not going to turn truth because Azov Battalion is not... It, well, it's not anymore um, a battalion separate, separated from the Ukrainian army. It's a part of Ukrainian army. So it's not, uh, as, as Russian uh, government calls it, Nazi or whatever. Um, so we just, we just hope that the agreement would work and every soldier would come back to Ukraine. Uh, talking about negotiations, uh, Anna, uh, Russia is saying that Ukraine has uh, practically withdrawn from the negotiations while blaming Kyiv uh, for Moscow failing to compromise. And I know that uh, this, re- this, this concerns the peace talks that are supposed to be taking place. Uh, what is the likelihood that a common ground can still be found now? Uh, well, what we know from uh, from the advisor to the head of president's office, Mr. Podolak, he today announced that um, the negotiations are suspended. Uh, they are suspended due to different uh, different reasons and uh, a lot of difficulties uh, within this negotiation that, uh, unfortunately, the Russian side is not, uh, according to him again, is not ready to negotiate. And they continue to try to put their, you know, uh, own um, decisions as a, you know, as the only and final. Uh, so what he said that negotiations should continue at one point, uh, but again, it will be possible only when Russian side would show signs of readiness for this negotiation. So I think that for the moment, and this is what it seems from the official um, official comments of this situation, that Ukrainian side is ready to negotiate, but uh, Ukrainian side understands very well that uh, the main negotiation is happening uh, at the battlefield, and there are a lot of uh, different, a lot of activities going on, and a lot of positive activity for Ukrainian uh, army uh, and Ukrainian um, and Ukraine. Uh, the country is happening in the Kharkiv region and in Donetsk region and Kherson region. So I think that uh, Ukrainian side is waiting for the best moment to, uh, to you know, to continue these negotiations. I think that. Um, uh, well, again, what President Zelensky mentioned before, that if situation with Mariupol would not be solved uh, in a way that Ukrainian soldiers are coming back alive. And uh, um, so in, in, any, in any kind of uh, final agreement, but they should come back alive. Uh, if this is not going to happen, then uh, negotiation would not continue. So we hope uh, that maybe this evacuation is actually a sign that uh, if finally the soldiers are back to Ukraine, negotiation could continue. But again, we'll see. Indeed, we'll see. We're hoping those soldiers come back alive. Anna, just before you go, um, Sweden and Finland did announce over the weekend they will be uh, joining NATO. And I know that that's something Ukraine wanted uh, before this war, which is the reason why this war is is even, even currently on. Um, how does the Ukrainian president feel uh, knowing that NATO is willing to welcome uh, Sweden and Finland with open arms and the fact that, you know, uh, Russia, even though threatening Finland, still hasn't done anything about, you know, their NATO bid, NATO membership bids. Uh, Mr. Zelensky um, said uh, both to in his in his speech to Ukrainian nation and also to the president of Finland in particular that definitely he supports and Ukrainian Ukraine supports uh, the decision of Finland. Um, it's a very logical decision and uh, especially taking into consideration what had ha- uh, of what had happened and uh, of uh, uh, of the behavior of Russia uh, of course Finland has a very long border with this country and it's quite a logical step uh, that they decided finally to to join NATO uh, president zelensky also uh, highlighted that situation now is a, li- a very different situation in terms of 
politics, in terms of economy, in terms of, uh, you know, military strength of Russia and the world. Uh, and that uh, probably, um, well, this decision is quite on time, uh, I mean, by Finland and by Sweden. Uh, so um, Ukrainian society and Ukrainian government sees it quite uh, obvious that they did it. In terms of Ukrainian future in this um, regard, well, it seemed that um, situation is changing because just recently um, the uh, representative of uh, the head, the temporary head of uh, the U.S. embassy in Ukraine said that uh, in the future Ukraine could also have this faster route to NATO uh, without any additional procedures as Sweden and Finland did. Uh, well, this is kind of a sign that probably, uh, you know, the society in the NATO states also have their mind changed. And I think that Ukraine, uh, well, again, we'll see how this war would end and uh, what, what would be the situation uh, in terms of economic situation, political situation, geopolitical situation, maybe at the end. But I think that this would definitely change uh, and it would be very different than it was before the 21st of February. So. It might be also a sign for Ukraine that actually, um, well, this is possible. And uh, also taking into consideration the reaction of Russian Federation when they say that, well, we never said that this could be a problem while they said, and we all remember that they said that they don't want uh, any uh, countries in the, you know, well, at their borders joining NATO. So, I mean, uh, you know, battlefield will decide everything. And of course, Ukrainian army is very different from what it was three months ago, with different equipment and different, uh, you know, experience. So I think this this might change everything for both Ukraine and NATO states. Indeed, it might change everything. And that's if they can get past Turkey at this time. Anna, thank you again for speaking with us and do stay safe. Thank you. In other news around Ukraine, U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen has called for U.S. allies to step up financial support for Ukraine, saying funds announced so far would not be sufficient for the country's short-term needs as it battles the Russian invasion. She was speaking at a Brussels economic forum earlier today, where she reminded uh, leaders that Ukraine's government has continued to function due to the ingenuity and bravery of the country's officials. With the war shuttering as much as half of Ukraine's economy, the country requires near-term external financing of about $5 billion per month to meet basic needs, according to President Volodymyr Zelensky. And services. Ukraine's immediate financing needs are significant. Due to the ingenuity and bravery of Ukrainian officials, their government continues to function. But in the months until tax collection can resume at pace, Ukraine needs budget funding to pay soldiers, employees, and pensioners, as well as to operate an economy that meets its citizens' basic needs. In short order, we'll need to turn to repairing and restoring critical utilities and services. Eventually, Ukraine will need massive support and private investment for reconstruction and recovery. And I sincerely ask all our partners to join us in increasing their financial support to Ukraine. Our joint efforts are critical to help ensure Ukraine's democracy prevails over Putin's aggression.